And we give thanks to the Spirit who sanctified you before you were born. To the most holy Trinity be glory and thanks forever. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, 
Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by a freeborn woman. The son of the slave, slave woman was born naturally, the son of the freeborn through a promise. Now this is an allegory. These women represent two covenants. One was from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. This is Hagar. Hagar represents Sinai, a mountain in Arabia. It corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery along with her children. But the Jerusalem above is freeborn, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, you barren one who bore no children. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the deserted than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as then the child of the flesh persecuted the child of the spirit, it is the same now. But what does scripture say? Drive out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not share in the inheritance with the son of the freeborn. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are children not of the slave woman, but of the freeborn woman. For freedom, Christ set us free. So stand free and firm, and do not submit against the yoke of slavery. Praise be to God. Then fear came upon all their neighbors, 
And all these matters were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard these things took them to heart, saying, What then shall this child be? For surely the hand of the Lord was with him. This is the truth. Peace be with you. Tell me you who want to follow the law. 
Haven't you read it? Haven't you seen what is in it? Don't you know that it means you can't have lobster or clams? All these directives of dietary laws and everything else that comes into it. I, as a rabbi of Tarsus, Pharisee, I know the law. Haven't you read actually what you're trying to do? And so what he goes through with them, he gives us an allegory. And what an allegory is, is a spiritual interpretation of a person or a place or a thing in the scriptures interpreted in the light of the gospel. This is very much, if you read the poetry of St. Ephraim, you have this continually. It's very much a Hebraic way of looking at the scriptures. So that we have two basic levels in scripture. We have the literary sense. This word means this, and it's in this place, in this paragraph. That's the fundamental sense of scriptures, what the words obviously actually mean. But we also have that these things foreshadow. Jeremiah is being persecuted by the people of Israel himself, foreshadows the suffering Christ being crucified on Mount Calvary. And so the object, what St. Paul is using of an allegory, he's taking an image of a story of the Old Testament, people who truly existed, not our historical people, and historical events, but he's now interpreting them in a spiritual sense by what they foreshadow in the light of the Gospel. So that's when he talks about Hagar and Sarah, a freeborn woman and a slave woman. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked about the age of Zachariah and of Elizabeth having this child. So what the story is, is from Genesis 21, if you want to read it. You go back and read in Genesis these stories about Abraham. As we mentioned, over the decades when God was making promises to Abraham about the number of children, descendants he would have, he continued always sterile. There were no children whatsoever, not even one. But this promise was always, there will be a vast number that shall come from your seed. And Abraham kept believing, he had no idea what this was supposed to happen. And as we mentioned, during these years, there's a point, and the term which is used, if you notice in the scripture quotation, as it's cited in the bulletin for you, he talks about the carnal method of the birth of one of the children. Carnal or fleshly doesn't mean sinful, it doesn't mean bad. It's not even referring to, to the conjugal act. It's referring to the act that it's purely natural. In other words, it's just human reason. Logical, makes sense, and there's no problem with it. And that's the event of Sarah coming to her husband Abraham and saying, look, I have no children. And as things go right now, so-and-so, your chief steward amongst these hundreds of people that follow you around this shake, is going to inherit everything by the traditions of our people. Now, that's acceptable, but wouldn't it be better if you had your own bloodline that were able to inherit everything you have? And that's when she tells Abraham, here, take one of my servant girls, she's a slave, take her as a second wife and have children with her. She's younger, I have not provided any children to you for all these decades, so take Hagar. And in the traditions of the time, that was perfectly acceptable. There's nothing wrong with what Abraham does, or even Sarah recommending it. Hagar is a slave. Hagar belongs to them. And so the, and for Hagar, it's definitely a step up in the hierarchy and the social picking order. And so with that, Abraham does take Hagar, well if it doesn't, my wife is the one who's recommending it for the sake of our inheritance, then I will do this. And he takes to himself Hagar. And Hagar, quite shortly after that, gives him a child, Ishmael. And Ishmael, by tradition, is the father, the patriarch of all the Arab peoples in the south. Petra, southern Jordan, the Arabian Peninsula, the Arab peoples. By tradition, their father is Ishmael. 
And things go up. We have Sarah, we have Hagar, we have the same family of people who've always been here, but now with a slightly change of relationship between the marriage as a second secondary wife, as a concubine we use the word. Concubine has a bit of loaded context to it. As a second wife, a secondary wife. And now a baby Ishmael. This baby is circumcised. It's important to remember it's part of the covenant that Abraham has. Because remember, they're arguing over laws, directives, circumcision, all of these things that are in the law of Mount Sinai. But Saint, what St. Paul does is in using this story, he emphasizes the fact that Sarah is a free woman and Hagar is a slave. And her condition changes by marrying Abraham, but she's still a slave. And so what St. Paul is pointing out is that what was done with the slave woman, the bond woman, was perfectly rational, completely according to nature, and completely acceptable. It was completely reasonable. And that's Hagar and Ishmael. But he now uses the allegory by saying, but what she represents in that kind of rational, common sense way of approaching religion is insufficient. The same way any Catholic who tries to just live at that level, it's insufficient. It's faith directed upon the transcendent God who has appeared to us in time in the Messiah. None of that is reasonable. None of that is just pure, rational, human thought. The faith moves us to transcend purely human wits. There's nothing wrong with human wits, but they are insufficient. And they will not bring us to salvation. We can be the finest educated physician with a good career, respectable position, polite children, and still go to hell. Because it's not sufficient to bring us into the divine light. And this is what St. Paul is pointing out. Everything that Abraham and Hagar and Sarah do are perfectly fine. But it's not sufficient for God's plan. And the free woman, she has the child of promise, Isaac. And we've mentioned this story. She doesn't actually believe because it doesn't make any sense. She's 90. Who is going to have a child at 90? So what happens here is that this is, goes beyond reason. It's not impossible. For heaven's sake, St. Camillus de Lellis' mother was 60 when he was born. So that's already pushing it. But 90? Well, usually that's beyond any consideration. But what happens here is that what God accomplishes through Sarah and Abraham by the child of promise goes beyond reason. It's not irrational. It goes beyond reason. Both Abraham and Sarah are still alive. There's no, there's a natural course of events, but there's nothing impossible for this to take place. And as a result, Isaac is born. Sarah doesn't really believe. She's the one who's dubious about this whole thing. But Abraham always believes. If God says, me at 100 and my wife at 90 are going to have a baby, well, I have no idea how, but I believe this. Because God has told me, and clearly this is part of the fulfillment of the promises. Because remember, Hagar is not God fulfilling that promise that all of your descendants shall be as the nut of the grains of sand on the seashore. This makes more sense, actually, at 90 and 100 having a baby, because it's God's doing, fulfilling God's promise, who initiated this whole thing in the first place. So from Abraham's point of view, my wife at 90 having this baby quite unexpectedly makes much more sense than just simply having had a child with one of my slave girls, which was just purely rational, but didn't seem to be part of the fulfillment of the promises. And that's exactly what St. Paul is pointing out in this allegory. When the gospel of the fulfillment of freedom and redemption are given to us, it's very clear who Hagar and Ishmael are relative to Sarah and Isaac. 
But the story goes on. Well, first of all, you note in the quotation, you have it in italics. It's a quotation from Isaiah, chapter 54. Rejoice, O barren one, who's left desolate. For she will have many children, more than the one who has, more than the woman who has a husband. That's kind of encapsulated, it's not the exact quotation. What Isaiah is prophesying about historically is obviously not Sarah. He's prophesying about Jerusalem in its destruction during the exile. When the Babylonians come, there's a military raid, they destroy the city of Jerusalem and they deport the people to the Mesopotamia. And during those 70 years, you just basically have rubble and ruins of what had been Jerusalem. And so what Isaiah is prophesying is you, the mother of Jerusalem, the mother of Israel, rejoice the one who's been left desolate. Because you will be fruitful again and multiply, and not only the children of Jerusalem itself, but you will have children throughout the world in a multitude. That's Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 54. St. Paul takes it from that and he applies it in this context to Sarah because Sarah is now an allegory of the heavenly Jerusalem who pimples the earth with the children of God through faith and baptism. Hagar and Ishmael. Well, in the story that goes on in chapter 21, we're told that the weaning ceremony of Isaac when Isaac is going to transition from being just a baby, nursing, to being a toddler, a baby, a child now, there's a whole ceremony, the weaning ceremony. As I mentioned last night to the people, in the Maronite tradition, we have a ritual blessing for your little boy's first haircut. It's not a weaning ceremony, but it has, you know, the mothers, they cry, taking them to the barber for the first time, and can I save it? Because it was so pretty, you let it grow as long as you can. Well, we have a whole blessing for this for the child's son's first haircutting. People usually look confused about it. It's from this Jewish background of moving the child from being mere baby to being child. And so, as I mentioned, and I'll mention here, the next one of you who has a baby will make sure that for the haircutting, we begin to restore some of these ancient traditions of ours. You don't have to be 90 to have a child. It can be earlier. So what happens at this weaning ceremony is at this point, Isaac is probably about 10. Excuse me, not Isaac. Ishmael is about 10. Isaac, of course, is being weaned. And during this ceremony, Isaac is playing with his little brother. But of course, the arrival of this child from the first wife dethrones him. Like any new baby coming into a family dethrones the other children. And everyone dotes on the baby. So the term which we have is Mishahak. Mishahak is translated as play. It can also have the idea of jostling or roughhousing. And it's, it has in the Hebrew a bit of the idea of, we've mentioned the little child who would play, and then when no one's really watching, smack the little baby. And this is what Ishmael is doing with Isaac. And Sarah sees this. And she knows this is going to be a problem, not just between the boys, but between Hagar and me. This is going to cause us problems. And so she actually, and it sounds quite cold-hearted, but she tells Abraham, okay, we have a baby, you get rid of her. The key around it is what happens at the weaning ceremony. And that's why St. Paul says in the epistle, if you look at it, it says, so what about the slave woman? And he says, cast her out. Her child will not be an heir of the promises. And Hagar is sent away with Ishmael, with provisions, and she's sent. And the angel of God appears to Hagar, Later on in the story, it doesn't have to do with the epistle directly here. 
But the angel of God appears to Hagar and says that you will be protected and your child will be the father of a great number of people. And of course, that's part of the tradition of the Arabs of the south coming from Ishmael. But it also means, as the story is being written in the Old Testament, that clearly the Arabs are not part of the promise. But they are all circumcised. They all follow the covenant of Abraham. But St. Paul is pointing out in his allegory, but the children of Ishmael are not heirs of the promise. You are the baptized because you fulfill the promises of faith of Abraham. Abraham is your father. And so he uses the image, Hagar, the earthly Jerusalem, which is still in bondage because it's following these laws which no longer have effect because they were only to prepare for the Messiah. But for us, our mother is above the heavenly Jerusalem. This is Sarah, the fulfillment of promise. This woman had nothing to do with the birth of this child in any kind of natural sense. God gave her Isaac in this miraculous birth of promise. And he says, we are the children of the heavenly Jerusalem. We are the ones by this faith in the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham who are free by faith. And so why do you, when even some of the descendants who are part of the circumcision are not heirs of the promise, why do you Galatians want to go backward and start following a bunch of outdated rules? This is the meaning of today's epistle. And what signifies this whole transition, as we celebrated yesterday the creation of the masterpiece of the human race, Mary of Nazareth, and the transition to a new order of consecration of priesthood. So today we celebrate the commemoration of this child on the icon, John, with his father sitting at the bottom of the corner of the icon with this tablet writing John. Yohan. The birth of this child initiates the beginning of the movement of the bondage from Jerusalem on earth to the freedom of the new Torah, of the gospel, which brings us this freedom through faith and through baptism. And that's why when St. Paul finishes this whole thing, when you understand this allegory he says, that Christ death and resurrection was his personal victory but by faith and baptism each of us is incorporated into that reality and we participate in that personal victory of the Messiah in so far as we personally consciously live that reality so we've mentioned continually faith is not Salvation is not magic, it's not something done to us. It's the reality of my conscious life of faith within the Messiah that allows me the participation of the resurrection and the glory and the triumph that we call salvation, that we call heaven. And the further that I'm away from that reality, even if I am baptized, salvation becomes further and further and further from me. And with that reality, St. Paul says, when you understand this, that the radical destruction of death and victory in the Messiah is given to us insofar as we live within Christ, then he gets, finishes by saying in that first line of the fifth chapter, then stand fast. Continue to live this reality that has set you free. Christ did not come to enslave us in anything else, but as it says, to make us free. So stand fast and do not be bound up again under the yoke of bondage, which has the meaning of the law of Moses, and it also has the meaning of the bondage of sin and our sinful and bad habits. Be free people, be children of God, and stand, fa stand fast in that triumph, <coughs> not under a yoke of bondage, but the freedom of the children. <coughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs>
and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Feast to your holy mysteries, feast to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith. Oh, 
يكون وحلف ساقية ما تقسي وما تيها حزايا حابرة حالي نعم على العالمين
With them we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your church. We pray to you, O Lord. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous, courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, May they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them to lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this altar, and those who have desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors. Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charlotte, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us, O God, to pardon and forgive the sins and remit with our doubtful knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your Oh, and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen.
You taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you, to call upon you with pure souls and clear consciences. Pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil. For you have power over all, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Now you met before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, that with them, we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. With your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Lord, one Lord, Son, one Lord, Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Peace be with you. Our sins and for our life. 
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness, and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace, blood of them. By your abundant mercy, give them life. By your holy cross, bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Just two announcements. One is to congratulate Mrs. Fairfield and the others who won during this last month of the, uh, the calendar selections and the, well, basically the lottery. The next month will be in March. And also the second point is, is to remind you that those booklets that you have in the pews of the Maronite Church, you are more than welcome. In fact, you are encouraged to take them with you. Read them, use them for apostolic purposes to explain to others what the Maronite Church is, or give them a copy also. You're more than welcome to take them, please. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <laughs>